Um, so I think this might be us. So um, I'm going to do an introduction. I'm going to read it right off of the the Eastern website, if that's okay, because your uh, biography on there is so nicely done. Is that okay, Dr. Carey? Sure. I, and if, if it's out of date, I'll let you know and I'll tell them to fix it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Carey is a philosopher married to a midwife. He thinks about the mysteries of life. She puts her hands on them. <laughs> and his wife, he and his wife have three sons and two grandchildren. His favorite theologian is Martin Luther which means he feels quite comfortable in a high church Anglican congregation where they love both word and sacrament. I believe you're a member at St. Mark's on Walnut. Is that correct? Uh, in Locust Street, yeah. Locust, yeah. Locust Street. City, yeah. Dr. Carey loves Luther because he thinks we know people by hearing their words. Hmm. That's how Luther taught us to know God. Yeah. He was writing a dissertation on this theme at Yale while working on a double degree in philosophy and religious studies back in the 90s. He was planning to write a little chapter on the Augustinian background to Luther's theology, but this grew into a whole large dissertation, which then grew over the years into three books on Augustine, who is endlessly fascinating and different from what he expected. Dr. Carey loves learning things by reading old books, and that is essentially what he teaches as far as he is concerned, the best old book is the Bible because it contains the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always cheers him up to teach anything that has to do with the gospel. Consequently, he has written a theological commentary on the presence of the gospel in the book of Jonah, as well as a little book based largely on conversations with his students, where he hopes to lure them into trusting the gospel rather than implying the whole slew of practical ideas to their lives, unbiblical ideas that do little more than make them anxious. It turns out the gospel of Christ tends to cheer them up too. <laughs> uh, Dr. Carey has recently started blogging his first thoughts, a blog posted on the website for the journal First Things. That was five years ago. I got to get them to take that one down. I haven't blogged there for a long time. Okay, so not blogging anymore, but uh, the list of his books are on the Eastern website, yep. which I think are really wonderful. I'm a huge fan. This is the book that got me to invite Philip um, through one of his students who works at St. James School, uh, Madeline Harris, um, yeah. fabulous young woman. Uh, the Meaning of Protestant Theology, Luther, Augustine, and the Gospel that Gives Us Christ. I love this book. You can see how much I brutalized it. Ah. It's <laughs> the good good books become velveteen rabbits. That's great. That's right. It's been it's been dog-eared to death. So okay. um, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Professor Carey. I'm going to make give him the full screen for his part of the talk. Okay. And uh, then we'll have questions and answers. Fair enough. All right. So um, we'll go till what about about quarter of? Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, that sounds good. That about right. And then um, you know I I we can talk uh, do questions and answers. Um, I figure. Um, maybe halfway there, I'll stop and ask you if you have any questions. I'm, I'm happy to be derailed because I can always get us back uh, if we have to. Um, I'm used to teaching seminar style, so I'm, I'm used to free-form conversation. Um, but let me get a few things on the table and um, about this book and, and why I wrote it and such. Um, one thing is, um, one of the... the one of the reasons that got me thinking about this book is a phenomenon that, that affected my life um, so many of my most thoughtful students and colleagues started out evangelical Christians, became Episcopalians, and winded up Catholics. Um, and I was wondering if it was, you know, my fault. I was, I, if, if it was my choice, I'd keep them Protestant, but, you know, being Catholic is a good way to be Christian, too. It's, it's just, it kept on happening. Um, I teach philosophy at Eastern University, which is more or less a, a broadly evangelical Christian college, uh, actually leans left, you know, which is kind of nice. It's kind of open. You can be Catholic there. You can be all kinds of Christians there. You don't have to be an evangelical, and I'm not. Um, and yet, here I am, uh, the senior philosophy professor at this small Christian college. And so we have a two-person philosophy department there over the years. We've had, uh, my junior colleague has, has been changed a few times. And each time, my junior philosophy colleague comes in an evangelical, becomes an Episcopalian, 
and winds up Catholic. Happened three times. Um, and it, two of them are, are the parents of, of my godchildren now. I, Episcopalians, when they were my godchildren, now they're, now they're all Catholics. So I'm wondering what's going on, right? I wanna think about this. It, in fact, it's a trajectory that's fairly common. Um, it's, it's really not my fault. Um, it's, uh, it's this, anti, well, 20 or 30 years ago, Robert Weber wrote a book called Evangelicals on the Canterbury Trail. Uh, you know, evangelicals have become Episcopalians and then they become Catholics, a lot of them. Um, I want to understand this phenomenon, um, and that's connected to deeper thinking that I've been doing for, for years and years and years. Um, for 30 years or so, I've been thinking about Martin Luther and what makes Luther Protestant and how Protestantism begins with Martin Luther. So the, um, the, um, the publisher gave the title of the book as The Meaning of Protestant Theology, which is a little bit portentous, and I didn't really mean it that way, but... The, the subtitle is, is, the, is really what it's about. Luther and Augustine and the gospel that gives us Christ. I take it that this notion of gospel and the gospel as a word that gives us Christ is at the center of Luther's thinking. And therefore it must in some way be central to Protestantism because of course Luther is, is where Protestantism uh, begins more or less pretty much. Um, and it's a very different kind of Protestantism than most of my students in this evangelical Christian college are used to. And that's something I want to think about too. Um, uh, right, here's what I'm thinking. There's of course a big difference between Protestants and Catholics, although maybe not as big a difference as we think. Luther ends up looking kind of Catholic by comparison to my evangelical students. Episcopalians can look very Catholic compared to my evangelical students. Anglo-Catholics can look especially Catholic uh, compared to evangelical students. Why is that? Well, I think there's a deep conceptual difference in traditions that think of sacraments as means of grace. Um, and, and my evangelical students tend not to think that way. And I'll, I'll talk about what, why that is. Um, but, you know, Episcopalians, if you've been Episcopalian or Lutheran for a long time, thinking about sacraments as means of grace, is, it's, it's in your bones, right? Uh, you don't have to think twice about a sacrament as something that, that con conveys to you a sacred gift. Uh, Lutherans love to talk about word and sacrament. It's a big cliche among them. Episcopalians sometimes use that phrase too, word and sacrament. Both of them, according to Augustine, both word and sacrament are signs. And um, uh, sacraments in the middle, middle Ages became this really special kind of sign because they're external signs that signify a gift of grace. You know, what signs do is they signify, of course. But these external signs not only signify a gift of grace, they give it to those who believe, to, to people who receive it rightly. So a sacrament is, a, is an external sign of an inward and spiritual grace that gives what it signifies. It is effectual, right? Um, the, the 39 Articles of the Episcopal Church talks about sacraments as effectual signs of grace. And Luther's absolutely on board with that. Um, and what's interesting, of course, then, is that words can also be effectual signs of grace. Words can work the same way a sacrament does. And, um, the, the major thesis of the book is that when Luther thinks about the gospel, he's thinking about it as fundamentally a sacramental word. Sometimes it's literally a sacramental word, like um, when a pastor says, this is my body given for you, speaking for Christ in a sacramental context in a way that basically gives you Christ's body through the word. So word and sacrament are bound up together. Um, but words also can function in this sacramental way, even apart from the sacraments. Um, the gospel, Luther thinks, is a story about Jesus Christ. And, you know, so what the story signifies is Christ. And that story gives Christ to those who receive it in faith. That's what the gospel does. That's why the gospel saves us. That's why the gospel is received by faith alone to use that phrase that's so important in Protestantism and especially in Luther, right? What do you need to do to, to receive Christ? Believe the gospel, faith alone is enough. And how is it that a word can give you 
salvation? How is, how is it that a word can give you a person? Right? That's the crucial thing, right? This word gives you a person. Well, it's, it's a sacramental word. Sacraments give what they signify when you receive them in faith. It's a little bit like a wedding vow. And this is a, a, a crucial metaphor throughout Protestantism, and it goes back to uh, very old ways of thinking in the Christian tradition. It's as if God is making a wedding vow, making a promise to his bride and saying, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. That's a promise. And by making that wedding vow, God gives himself to his people because that's what wedding vows are for. Right. Certain kinds of promises are ways of giving yourself to another person. Uh, I'll always be there for you. Right. You can depend on me. Now, sometimes we keep those promises. Sometimes we don't. But when we keep those promises, we're giving ourselves to other people in, in some way. And I think the wedding vow is an especially important example of that because it's a sacred vow. You're, you're saying, um, um, until death do us part. Um, I belong to you, you belong to me, um, just like God and his, and his people. So that's in medieval terms going, you know, in, if you were thinking the way Luther is as a late medieval theologian, that's a sacramental way of thinking. Words can give you things. Words are signs that don't just signify something, don't just mean something, they can give you what they're talking about, especially if there's a promise. So Luther thinks of the gospel as centered on the promises that are part of the story of Christ. Within the gospel story, Christ makes promises. Uh, he promises, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. And he makes that promise. Um, Luther thinks that when Jesus says, um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a promise. And it, it, it's the basis for the sacrament of penance and of, of absolution. And although Luther doesn't make penance into a separate sacrament, he does love, he absolutely loves that word of absolution. Um, and that's a sacramental thing. Um, maybe a, we can talk about the original setting of that in the 16th century. And then I wanna get back to my evangelical students and why they're different. But in, in the early 16th century, here's Martin Luther, who is famously going to confession all the time, right? He's, he's, he's got a huge sense of sin, right? He's got a conscience that won't quit. But so do a lot of people in those days. Um, a lot of people are really terrified of, um, of going to hell, right? Because if you die without confessing all of the mortal sins that you've committed, right? Then, then there's no hope for you, right? Uh, one of the striking things about, um, if you read Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, there's lots of Christians in hell. Right? They're baptized Christians. They believe the Christian gospel, but you know they they haven't they've committed mortal sin and they haven't confessed their sins. So um, there's a famous story about this. Uh, here's Martin Luther, uh, young Martin Luther. Originally, he was going to be a law uh, law student. He was going to be a lawyer, and he's walking back to law school uh, after a semester break, and he's out in the uh, out in the fields, and there's a thunderstorm, and. Um, to this day, the old uh, Book of Common Prayer has prayers against sudden death, because sudden death is particularly terrifying if you're if you're middle if you're in the Middle Ages, right? Because it means you don't have chance for for short shrift, which means a quick confession of your sins, right? So it's like you know having a gun held to your head, except not only may this bullet kill you, it may send you straight to eternal torment, with no exit, no escape. So what do you do? You might die the next moment, and and that's the beginning of eternal torture. This is what you know, young Martin Luther was thinking probably around uh, 1505 or so. Um, and then he said, St. Anne, help me, I'll become a monk. St. Anne, help me, I'll become a monk. He's making a promise to a heavenly patron, a patron saint, who's gonna put a good word in with God so that he doesn't die. And then he'll pay her back by dedicating his life to monastic uh, spirituality. Right. He could have made a little bit less dramatic vow. He could have said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for masses or I'll go on pilgrimage to Santiago. But instead he dedicated his whole life as a way of paying St. Anne back so that he doesn't go straight to hell from the thunderbolt. Very medieval, very Catholic, right? Um, now the mature Luther would say, trust in Christ, he's your savior, believe that. And that's, what, and that's all there is to it. But you can imagine this kind of terror, right? What happens if I die with, with these mortal sins that I haven't confessed? 
and I need to go to my priest and confess them. But then there's this extra problem. Um, I'm supposed to have contrition, right? And, and this is a good thing to have. Contrition means that you, you really hate your sins, you regret your sins, you wish you hadn't done them, you didn't want to be that person who committed that sin. And that's, that's part of the sacrament of penance, and that's a good thing. But the, the discipline of penance in the Catholic Church, I think to this day, assumes your sins are not going to be forgiven unless you have proper contrition. You can't go to confession, confess to a priest, and then expect that you're going to get off scot-free without regretting what you did. You have to really hate your sins. So Luther had this problem. He has a conscience that doesn't quit. And here he is confessing his sins, but he's not sure he has enough contrition. He's not sure that he really, really hates his sin, right? So maybe he's, his sins aren't really forgiven, right? So this becomes a real problem. Luther ends up um, trying to uh, justify himself before God by, by hating himself, right? He actually had a whole spirituality of self-hatred. And if you hated yourself enough, then God would justify you because you really had to hate yourself because you're a sinner. A pretty miserable theology, I think. And I think this all changed, I'll, I'll skip over parts of the story. I think this all changed when he had to think about the sacrament of penance in a new way. But really the first time he ever thought about sacraments as a theologian was in, probably in 1518. He has to think about the sacrament of penance because it's involved with these indulgences and all that stuff that was uh, the big deal with, in the 95 Theses. He's thinking about penance and he has to deal all of a sudden with this word I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. That's the word of absolution. It comes at the end of the sacrament of penance. It's clearly modeled on the baptismal formula, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the, in, instead the priest says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the, the conclusion of the sacrament of penance. And Luther thought about this and um, he realized it's based on this promise of the keys, whatever you bind in heaven is Bound, whatever you bind on heaven, sorry, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And the word for loose is really the same word in Latin as absolve. It's solvere. So it's really, it's the basis of, of the word of absolution. It's a promise of Christ and therefore a promise of God, which means when the pastor or priest says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, that's Jesus Christ saying that he absolves you of your sins. At that point, Luther's thinking, if, if Christ says that to me, well, then who am I to say otherwise? Who am I to think that I might still be guilty? Who am I to say, well, I don't have enough contrition. I'm re not really sure I'm forgiven. I don't dare say that if Jesus Christ himself is absolving me of my sins. Right? I can't hear Jesus say, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then say, well, I'm not really sure my sins are forgiven because I'm not sure I have enough contrition. Right? Instead, Luther says, you should simply believe the word of absolution. Just believe that Jesus isn't lying to you, right? That the, that the, the word of, of the promise of God is true. Don't call God a liar. That, that's at the heart of Luther's whole theology. So this is Jesus saying to you that your sins are forgiven. Don't call him a liar and simply believe that he's telling you the truth. That's where you get this Protestant notion of justification by faith alone. Right? Don't worry about whether you have enough contrition. You probably don't. Don't worry about whether you love God enough. You probably don't. Don't worry if you have mortal sins. You probably have mortal sins in your soul. All of that is irrelevant by comparison to the truth of the gospel, the truth of this promise of Christ that says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the sacraments work like that. The gospel works like that. It's as if Jesus Christ himself says, your sins are forgiven. I've died for you after all, right? What are you worried about? Your own you know, failures, mortal sins, all that. That's all irrelevant, right? We'll, we'll deal with that later on. But right now, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So that's a sacramental word. It's also the gospel. Luther identifies this kind of word in which Christ speaks to us a word of grace and mercy as the gospel word. And we receive it simply by believing it, believing that he's not lying. And that's our salvation. And then the whole gospel works that way, right? Uh, when Jesus says, oh, 
to the mouth of a priest, he says, this is my body. It's given for you. You should believe that he's telling you the truth, that this is Jesus giving himself to you because he doesn't lie. So if you want to know whether Christ is really giving himself for you as your savior, believe the gospel in the sacrament. Right? It's an incredibly powerful thing. And it, oddly enough, I mean, it's this sacramental notion, very, very Catholic in one way, but it overturns a certain kind of medieval Catholic anxiety, right? Especially the anxiety about whether I'm in a state of mortal sin. Uh, Luther comes along uh, a year or so later and says, eh, all of your sins are mortal. Forget it, right? There's no way that you're going to be perfectly sinless. Believe the gospel. Receive it by faith alone. Don't trust in your works, your love, your contrition, anything in your soul other than the gospel. Just believe that the gospel is true. That's what he means by, by justification, by faith alone. Just believe this. And you have whatever you believe if you're believing in the promise. Now, that's, I think, changed the world that recognition, it, it, it freed people from this terrible anxiety, right? If I'm about to get hit by a thunder, thunderbolt, I just remember um, what Luther would do is, he, I'll remember that I'm baptized because it was Jesus himself who said, I baptize you, right? Authorizing some priest to say it for him, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So therefore I belong to Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, if a thunderbolt hit me, hits me, I go to my Lord because he said so. He promised, right? And I can trust the promise of God. That, I think, is, oddly enough, the beginning of Protestantism. It's a, it's a sort of sacramental notion of the gospel. Um, and that's why I think that Catholics and Protestants don't have to be fundamentally divided on this issue. Right? The gospel, which is the, the sort of the gospel notion that's at the center of Protestantism is a Catholic sacramental notion. Right? You can't have Protestantism without Catholicism. You can't have the Protestant gospel without the Catholic sacraments. This is, I think, one of the things that's pulling so many people from evangelicalism to Episcopalianism to Catholicism. And I think it's, a, it's an experience experiential thing that's actually very important for many of my students. So I'll say a little bit about that and then, then we can um, break for questions and things. Um, let's go back with American evangelicals, right? 300 years, 400 years downstream from Luther, we have Jonathan Edwards and the American revivalist tradition. And then you have American evangelicals like my students, um, most of whom are not Episcopalians, most of whom are, are one version of evangelical or another. And many of them are anxious. Um, anxiety, you can really tell a lot about a theology by what kind of anxiety it gives you, right? So they're anxious about whether they're really Christians because you know, if you're sinning and you're evangelical, you don't believe in mortal sin. You've never really heard of mortal sin. That's a Catholic notion, but you're worried that you're not really a Christian because you're sinning. And um, suppose somebody asks you, are you really a Christian? Well, the evangelical answer is something like, yes, I've given my heart to Christ. I've made a decision for Jesus. I've accepted Jesus into my life. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I've had a conversion experience. Uh, likewise, if you ask an evangelical, are you born again? Right, they're supposed to refer to a certain kind of experience that they've had, or maybe a decision that they've made. Now, strikingly, if you ask Luther, are you born again? He says, sure, I'm baptized, right? Now that's the answer that a catechized Catholic should give also an Eastern Orthodox theologian or, or Christian. And it's, it's built into the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. Uh, if you may recall the last time you've heard someone baptized, um, let me read this to you, I just love it. Um, right after, oh no, before the, the baptism and the thanksgiving over the water, the priest will pray, we thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. So the Episcopal prayer book is saying, this is how you're born again, is through baptism. Um, now, the words I just read you are a set of words that most evangelicals will never hear. Right? That, that here is this thing that happened to you, and through it, you are buried with Christ. That's already happened if you're baptized. By it, you share in his resurrection. 
That's already sealed and delivered. And through it, you're reborn by the Holy Spirit. That's already happened. Um, most evangelicals don't believe this, right? Um, and in fact, the, um, the 39 Articles, which are the confessional document of the Episcopal Church, uh, actually, um, it specifically disagrees with um, the low church evangelical view of this. Here's um, Article 25 um, on the sacraments. Sacraments ordained of Christ, say the 39 Articles. So this is the confession of the Episcopal Church going back to the 16th century. Sacraments ordained by Christ are not only badges or tokens of Christians' profession. That's what my students believe. Right? That, that, that baptism is how you confess and profess that you're a Christian. You give your heart to Christ, and then you get baptized to, to publicly announce that you're, you're a Christian. So the baptism is a sign of what's in your heart, the faith. Well, the 39 articles say it's a whole lot more than that. Sacraments ordained of Christ are not only badges or tokens of Christian profession, but rather they are certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace. And that's why the, the liturgy works the way it does in baptism. It's saying in baptism, something has happened to us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we're born again. So that's a really interesting division. You know, if you ask Christians throughout the world, are you born again? The, the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, and Episcopalians, if properly catechized, will say, sure, I'm baptized. My evangelical students will say, um, well, I'm not sure, but I think I gave my heart to Christ, and I think I really meant it that time. That, um, I'll tell, tell you a little story about this one. Um, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention and, and Baptists are evangelicals who don't have this high sacramental theology. A man named J.D. Greer wrote a book called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Life. Why? Because as a kid, he said he prayed that sinner's prayer where you ask Jesus into your life about 5,000 times. You can see why, right? He kept on wondering whether he really meant it. Did he really give his whole heart to Jesus? It's a lot like that question, did I really have enough contrition? Right? You look into your heart and see if it's real enough, if it's sincere enough. And if it's not, you try again. And, and, and Greer said he must have done it 5,000 times, as well as getting baptized five or six times, because he wasn't really sure that he really believed. Now, if you're Luther, you get baptized because Jesus commanded you to. Jesus says, believe and be baptized. Okay, so I, I better believe and be baptized. Uh, and that way I know that, God, that God's on my side because he said so. Um, I think that that makes a huge difference. I think that many of my students, when they discover the great tradition, when they discover the, the, the larger tradition of the Christian faith, and especially the sacramental tradition, um, they love it. They get bitten by the liturgy bug. Uh, it happened to my student, Madeline Harris, that, uh, that Jarrett knows. Um, you get bitten by the liturgy bug, and you want to hear words like this, right? You want to hear over and over again a word like, um, we thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Right? This is enough to make you realize, ah, God wants to redeem me and save me. God wants to make me a Christian. He's in the business of doing that. And he's already said so. Isn't that wonderful? And as I say, most of my evangelical students have never heard such a word. They've never heard that. Um, let me say maybe one more thing about how the decisive difference happens. Uh, I'm suggesting that the difference between Protestants and Catholics is conceptually at least not as deep as the difference between those who believe in sacraments and those who don't. Right? And this is important because of course, Protestantism begins with this sacramental word of the gospel. So here's a, a, a way of thinking about it. And uh, I'll, I'll try to bring this point across and then, then we can um, do, do questions and answers. Um, the Protestant tradition has always assumed um, that the gospel is a kind of promise. Um, John Calvin will come along a generation after Luther, and he'll say Christian faith, by definition, is faith in the promises of God, not just faith in the commandments. Commandments can't save you because they tell you what to do, and that's good works, and good works can't save you. Right? It's the promise of God that you have to, to hang on to, the promise of God in Christ. Right. So that's a, a common Protestant teaching. Luther has it, Calvin has it, 
Baptists have it. What, it, what I was thinking as I was writing this book is that Calvin and most Protestants are thinking of a different set of promises than Luther is. Luther is thinking of sacramental promises, like I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or this is my body given for you. Calvin, and I think most Protestants are thinking of um, a kind of general principle that's actually a conditional promise. It goes something like, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved. Right? Now there's a promise, but notice it's conditional, if you believe. So you gotta know you meet the, the, the condition. So you say, oh, if I believe in Christ, I'm saved. Well, I believe in Jesus, I've given my heart to Christ, I've prayed the sinner's prayer, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So I have to know I meet the condition. I have to know I really truly have saving faith. I have to somehow determine that my faith is real. If I doubt whether I really have true faith, then I doubt whether I'm saved, right? Um, and that's why the conversion experience becomes so important for so many evangelicals. They're thinking if they do the conversion experience right, if they really make that decision for Jesus, then they're saved. Um, Luther never does that. For Luther, you can make decisions for Christ all you want. You also make decisions against Christ. It's called sin and, and sin has unbelief mixed in with it. And all of us believers are also unbelievers, heaven's sakes, we experience that all the time. So we make decisions for Christ, we make decisions against Christ. That's not gonna save us. What's going to save us is the promise of God. So instead of believing that I believe, I just get to believe the sacrament. And, and let me walk that through um, one more time because it, it's, it, it's a, a tricky bit of logic that I think makes a huge difference in how you think and experience the faith. Suppose you're, you know, like my evangelical students, the promise of God for you is this conditional general principle. If you believe in Christ, you're saved. Well, then you better meet the condition. Yes, I believe in Christ, right? A, a, a belief about myself, maybe something introspective. Maybe I look inside my heart and, and find that I really believe. Um, oh, but maybe I don't. Uh, uh, but if I believe, then I can be sure of my salvation. And, and that's the structure of a whole lot of Protestantism, I think. That's not how Luther's thinking. That's not how the, these words in the Episcopal prayer book work. There, it's an unconditional promise. Right? Because it's a sacramental promise. And it goes back especially to baptism. Right? If baptism is a promise of salvation, then it's an unconditional promise. Because what it's saying is, I baptize you. And when I was baptized, that was said to me, and it meant me. So I don't have to, to meet the condition. Right? So if you got this general statement, if you believe in Christ, you're saved. You got to apply it to yourself individually. Okay, I meet the condition. I'm one of those who believe in Christ. That's how I know that I'm saved. Well, how do you know that you're born again and a Christian if you're Luther? Well, you were baptized because when you were baptized, God said, I baptize you, and he meant you, you individually, right? The sacramental word, because it's very external, it's a, it's a word that happens at a particular place and a particular time to a particular person can say you, Y-O-U, and mean me or you, right? It was said to you. I take it as said to each one of you. And when it was said to you, it meant you, right? You don't have to ask, oh, what, what condition do I have to meet? Right? You've been splashed with the water. The word has been said to you. And therefore God said it to you and he meant you. We can still reject this word and, and baptism is not some sort of uh, artificial guarantee of salvation, but it's like a wedding vow. It's a promise that means you in particular which you can always hang on to, cling to. If you're worried about whether you're a Christian, just ask whether God really said this to you. That's how Luther will think about it. And as I say, I think it, it frees you from a whole range of anxieties. The Catholic anxiety is about whether you've really had enough contrition or the Protestant anxieties about whether you've really given your heart to Christ. Now, some days I give my heart to Christ and other days I don't. Right? And you know, if I really want something like assurance of salvation, I better hear it from God because I'm not gonna hear it from myself. Right? So, you, so the lovely thing about Luther, I think, and the whole sacramental tradition is it turns your attention away from yourself, away from your own heart, away from your own faith, away from your own experience, away from your own uh, contrition and turns it to the promise of God. Right? And um, 
as, as uh, Jarrett mentioned, um, I think this is how you know another person. Another person tells you who they are, makes a promise and says, I will be for you. I will be your best friend. I will be your husband or your wife. You will be my people. I will be your God, right? That's, those are promises. And you know, if you cling to them, then you know who this person is because they're gonna keep their word, especially if God is gonna keep his word. Um, you know, good husbands and wives, they keep their word. Right? They make this promise and, and they spend the rest of their lives being the person they promised to be for the sake of the other person. God is like that, I think, or rather we're like God when we um, are faithful to our wedding vows. And I think that's a great comfort. I think that's what moves my evangelical students toward the liturgical kind of churches, uh, Episcopalian, Lutherans, Eastern Orthodox, Catholics. They love hearing those words those sacramental words, which really have the shape of the gospel. Um, because Protestantism begins, I think, with that sacramental no notion of the gospel, which opens a big wide door to the rest of the Christian tradition. Um, anyway, that's, that's how I was thinking in the book. And um, there's a whole lot more details we could talk about um, and ins and outs. Um, so uh, why don't I stop there and ask you what your questions might be uh, about all that? having said a bunch of things on the table. Go ahead, Scott Robinson, go ahead. There. Um, I have a question, but first I wanted to just mention, um, I taught at Eastern myself for 10 years. I taught music and- um, I think we cross paths now and then, yeah. Yes, uh, when you sang uh, St. Patrick's Breastplate at, at the beginning of that one lecture that happened to follow St. Patrick's Day. Ah, okay. Uh, anyway, um, I want to mention one of my students, a uh, well, piano student from back in the day, is even now navigating the ordination process for the Episcopal priesthood. So this is this is still going on. Um, but my question is, um, one of the things I used to teach was music and world cultures. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, introduce them to the Shona people of Southwest Africa, who, in, who were evangelized by a man named Bernard Mzeki, one of the first sub-Saharan African um, uh, um, sorry, my, my, my phone just rang. For right. Sub-Saharan African missionaries to work in that part of Africa. And uh, he was able to um, make a connection between the Shona Ancestor Federation mm. and the Christian doctrine of the communion of saints. Oh, okay. And that was his, his, his way in with the Shona. But what I found over and over again was that not, not one of my students in my in, in many of those classes had any notion of the of the communion of saints. Oh, right. And I wonder if you, if you could speak to that. How did that fall off their their their, their radar? Oh, yeah, communion of saints. Um, I mean, it's in the Apostles' Creed for one thing. You would think that, of course, most evangelicals are not creedal. Right. Um, most evangelicals, my students come in not knowing the Nicene Creed or even the Apostles' Creed. Um, and in fact, um, yeah, I think it's partly a matter of what happens in any tradition when you get the kind of social structure of the tradition without any catechesis. Right. There's plenty of Roman Catholics who don't know the first thing about their own faith. Well, evangelicals can do the same thing, really. And um, when that happens, American individualism takes over because, right, so it's like you and Jesus and the Bible, and maybe not even the Bible, maybe it's just you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in your heart, right? Um, so it becomes very individualistic. Um, my students do not talk about the church. They talk about Christians. We as Christians, they love that phrase, right? Um, what should we as Christians think about this, right? So the language of the church is not part of their regular vocabulary, um, much less a robust notion of what the church is. Um, the notion of the body of Christ is not something that they've heard much about. Uh, they really think it's all about what we Christians do with, with the Bible and, and, you know, maybe we work with other Christians, but really Christianity is this individual thing. Um, and that's, that is a sad thing. Let me mention that the communion of saints is a particularly lovely theme in Luther's theology um, because um, it's, a, it's a communion, communion in the Latin, which is where, where Luther would have learned the creed. Communion means sharing. 
And the word for saints can mean both holy people and holy things. It's communio sanctorum, communio meaning sharing, sanctorum meaning holy people and saints, or holy things. So Luther thinks that the church is the place where holy things are shared by holy people. And what happens in the church is that Jesus Christ shares his righteousness and sanctification and holiness and blessedness and eternal life with us. And then we share it with each other, but also we share each other's burdens, right? There's this lovely sharing where if I've got something that you need, I share it with you. And if you got, if you need my help, I, I give you my help. If I need your help, I, but that begins with Jesus himself who shared his eternal life with us and then took upon himself our death and sin. He, it was a kind of blessed exchange or happy exchange uh, as it's called. Um, we get his righteousness and holiness and blessedness and eternal life. He gets our sin and death and carries it to the cross and defeats it there. But, but first of all, he you know, takes on our, our sin and death. It's like that marriage again, right? Um, and Luther compares it to a marriage, right? Our bridegroom gives his bride, which is the church, all of his blessings. And the bride, well, she's, she's only got liabilities and debts and, and Jesus takes that and, and, and takes care of it. And meanwhile, what do we do with all these blessings that he's pouring out on us? And Luther thinks it's like, it's like being filled up to the brim with blessing. It spills over, you share it with other people. And um, if you're needy, they share it with you. And so there's this sharing that goes on from Jesus to us and then from us to each other um, and the spilling over a blessing, but also the taking on of liabilities and debts and sin and death for the sake of, of the people you love and care about. Um, and that's what the church is. It's the place where that happens. Um, it's also the place where the gospel is preached. So where Christ is given to others in word and sacrament. Um, and, and when you start thinking that way, yeah, you, you no longer just think of yourself as a lonely Christian with you and God. Uh, you realize you need other Christians and you, you, you have other Christians because you're in a body together. Um, and yeah, and you, and you have this wonderful sharing of the blessings that, that Christ gives his people. Um, but yeah, I, your average evangelical has, not, has literally not heard of the communion of saints. Um, I'll say one more thing about that. Um, and that is that one of the things missing in a non-liturgical church setting is the creed, right? When you, have, when you say the creed every Sunday, um, you'll get used to notions like the communion of saints. And eventually you'll ask, oh, why are we saying that? What does it mean, right? We said it every time someone gets baptized, we have the apostles creed. Uh, what does it mean, right? And, and eventually you learn, um, right? It's like pegs you can hang stuff on, right? And evangelical students don't have as many pegs to hang stuff on. Hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you. Other questions for uh, um, Bonnie? Okay. Um, I was wondering whether you could speculate or maybe more than speculate as to why the movement from Episcopalianism to Catholicism, hmm. and I'm also aware that your school has an Eastern Orthodox program or an Eastern class. Uh -huh studies, which has invited and students have made the leap into, yeah. into orthodoxy. And I'm wondering, what do you think is their anxiety with that middle step, yeah. which where most of us are? Yeah. And, uh, because I think there's anxiety wherever you are, mm -hmm. I think human condition to begin to question, questioning is good, but questioning becomes very obsessive at times. So I'm wondering, what are those questions that make them move to mm, that next step? Right, right. Yeah. right. So to pick up on a general point you made, I think every theological tradition has its own distinctive anxieties. And, and a healthy theological tradition will, will shape a Christian life in such a way that anxieties are located in a particular way and pastoral care is directed towards that anxiety. So if you're Catholic, you worry about having mortal sin. You go to confession. If you're um, if you're Calvinist, you worry about whether you have true saving faith, and you work and and you get pastoral care about assurance of salvation. Uh, and if you're Lutheran, you worry about whether um, whether the hidden God really wants to damn you, and you you go to baptism. Um, what moves people from Episcopalianism to uh, Catholicism? Um, 
let me mention <laughs> three of my junior colleagues. Did I mention this? My three of my junior colleagues in the philosophy department began as evangelicals, became Episcopalian, and then ended up Catholics. Mostly, they got fed up with the Episcopal Church. <laughs> uh, All right, but what aspect of it? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> for some of them, um, it was. Um, there's a kind of mushiness th that the Episcopal Church can get into, uh, mm -hmm. especially about things about matters of sex, and um, and well, 20 years ago it was mushiness about matters of sex. Now, if you have the wrong views of sexuality, you could end up losing your church property, right? So, um, if you take uh, a, a traditional conservative view of Christian sexual morality, and you you have a whole church uh, in the Episcopal Church that 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 takes that um, conservative view, and you want to say, mm, we and our bishop are not getting along about that. Uh, we want to leave the Episcopal Church and maybe join the Anglican Church in North America. You, you probably know about this, right? Um, well, the, the, um, the national office of the Episcopal Church will sue you to make sure that, that you don't get your church building and can't leave the Episcopal Church with your, your church building. So for many folks on the conservative side of things, it seems like the national church was persecuting traditional Christians. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, does attract my students to a liturgical church is this conservative emphasis, this rediscovery of the long, long tradition uh, of Christian faith. They're, they find like they're, they're finding their home in something that's older than American evangelicalism. But many of them want to go back beyond just say the Elizabethan settlement of 1600 in, in the Church of England. They want to go all the way back to St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas or St. Bonaventure or St. Athanasius. Um, and, and if that's happening, the discovery of the church fathers, especially, then that's likely to lead you back to Catholicism or orthodoxy. And it situates you in a very traditional Christian setting um, with some ballast, I guess, against the, the winds of, of change in the contemporary church. Yeah, I, I think a, a chapter of um, Dr. Carey's book I'd really recommend is number nine. Um, mm. It's on scripture. It's called "Demanding the Wrong Kind of Certainty." Um, it's a really fascinating. Uh, it's one of the best of its kind I've read in terms of. Um, I don't want to put this. Uh, dealing with uh, the stresses of modernity mm -hmm. on faith, which causes some of the anxiety. I think that um, people are attracted to a conservative stance on faith. Sometimes are anxious by the fluidity of modernity, right? Right, right. And, and, and what Professor Carey does is, is actually embraces kind of what you call a right-leaning postmodernism, which I think is really- I actually call it right-wing postmodernism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, maybe I should say a little bit about that. Um, think of, of post, the, the, uh, there's something what, that I call the postmodern insight, which is that modernity is a tradition. Modernity is a tradition that is anti-traditional, right? So, so modernity constitutes itself as, as an op opposition to traditional points of view, right? Tradition, you know, means ignorance and oppression and, you know, tradition, tradition. Why is there a fiddler on the roof? I don't know, it's tradition, right? Tradition means ignorance. It means that you don't let your daughter get married to a goy because, and, and you know, she's dead to you if she marries a goy. So tradition is oppressive, right? If, if you remember um, Fiddler on the Roof. Um, the guy who wrote Fiddler on the Roof was a modernist, right? Tevye isn't modern, but the guy who wrote it is modern, right? Tradition means ignorance. Tradition means oppression. Um, so, and that's modern. Um, but then modernity itself turns out to be a tradition, right? Everything happens in a social context. Modernity is, is its own social context. Um, it has its own tradition. And an anti-traditional tradition is going to get into trouble when it realizes it's a tradition. Right? That's what I call the postmodern insight. And um, what you can do with that insight is either say, ah, well, looks like, looks like there's no possibility of, of, of rationality, right? Uh, reason itself is going to be a traditional thing. Reason itself has a tradition. So that means reason is irrational, right? And you get uh, 
what I'll call left-wing postmodernism, right? Reason itself becomes a form of irrationality. Rationality itself becomes a form of oppression. Uh, you can actually read rationality that way. Lots of people think of that rationality now as a form of oppression. Um, or you can think that maybe traditions can be the home of rationality. And that's what I call right-wing postmodernism, right? And uh, there's, there's a bunch of philosophy that works that way, especially Alistair McIntyre. A, a tradition could be a home of rationality, which means that there's more than one kind of rationality out there, right? Jewish rabbinic rationality is different from Christian philosophical rationality, right? Um, but the, these are different ways of being rational, but the tradition can be a home for rationality if it's self-critical, if it has room for critical questions. To go back to Bonnie's point, right? Questions make us anxious, right? But if we're say healthy Westerners, we have a little bit of Socrates in our system, right? Socrates gets us used to asking questions. And you know, mind you, I'm a philosophy professor, so I spend a lot of time with Socrates, right? Socrates is the patron saint of questions, right? And that, yeah, that does make us anxious, but you got to live with those questions because t you know, time and history really happen and change really happens. You got to figure out how to ask those questions. So a healthy tradition will both have continuity with its own past and respect its own past, but will also be able to, to ask new questions and, and deal honestly with new questions. And um, there's no guarantee in advance that a, that a, a tradition will stay healthy. Um, the, the reason for Christians to believe in the Christian tradition is to believe in the Holy Spirit, who's sort of at work in the Christian tradition. So here's, here's the thing that happens with scripture and with Protestants. Protestants were famous for believing in scripture alone, right? Um, and what, what that meant originally was um, that you, the Pope doesn't have a right to make up new doctrines and send you to hell if you don't believe what the Pope tells you, right? If it's not in the Bible, you don't have to believe it. That's really what it originally meant. Um, but it, it became eventually the notion that it's just me and my Bible and the Bible is nice and clear and I can be certain of what the Bible says and um, I don't have to believe anything about the rest of the Christian tradition, right? It's, it's like, there's no communion of saints. They're just me and my Bible, right? Um, the problem is that, that biblical interpretation becomes more and more tricky the further you go in history. Luther could write as if all he was doing was just telling you what the Bible said. John Calvin was brilliant at making his interpretation of the Bible look like it wasn't an interpretation at all. It's just telling you what the Bible says. And this is really what Protestants want to do is just tell you what the Bible says. It's not interpretation. It's just what the Bible says. But it turns out as soon as you start learning biblical scholarship, it doesn't work that way, right? You start learning that there's a long tradition of interpretation. Your own tr uh, interpretation, including John Calvin's interpretation, has a history behind it, right? And all of a sudden, instead of this transparent relationship to the text, you've got an opaque relationship to the text. You're part of a tradition of interpretation, right? Well, can that be a rational and, and you know, responsible way to interpret? Yes, it can be, I think, right? If it's a healthy, self-critical intellectual tradition, but that's got to leave place for questions, including difficult questions, unanswered questions. You know, what do we say about same-sex marriage? What do we say about transgender folks? I think that, that issue has simply not been resolved in the Christian tradition yet, right? And um, we better be able to ask that question honestly and not sort of think we already know the answer, right? Um, and what, how, where will we end up? I don't know, right? I, I actually don't know. Um, my, my student Madeline and I actually disagree about this. Um, but that's how traditions work. A healthy tradition will have these difficult discussions and we'll be able to ask questions. Yeah. Oh, John, go ahead. I, I think you need to unmute. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those uh, retired Lutheran pastors who's very happy at St. Martin's. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. and, and um, I, I'm not going to go through my journey, but uh, my journey has led me to a, a kind of universalism. Ah, mm hmm and um, I'm guessing that you've dealt with that issue enough to kind of guess how, how I got there. I, I can anticipate some of where the, the dots are that you, you connected for that, yeah. Yeah, so um, some, of, some of what you have said uh, made me think, oh yes, 
um, that's part of that's those are some of the dots that have led me here. The unconditional promise. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the the gradations of uh, of doubt and sin, which include intellectual and emotional um, shortcomings, mm -hmm. um, as well as moral failings. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm curious about, uh, and then other things that you said, especially the, the uh, I'm, not, I'm not totally clear on where sacramentalism uh, stops for you, because for me, it just keeps getting up to mean mm. wider and wider things, like creation is a sacramental mm. mm -hmm. um, uh, thing. Yeah. So I'm curious, I'm curious how you how you respond to a universalist uh, be, because I still kind of know that I'm, I'm not half baked, but I'm not totally baked either. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, that's a, a big issue, but I, I think there's a few things that can be said fairly briefly about it. One is um, that all of us, I think in this particular discussion right now, in this Zoom, this Zoom call, are probably in a very different place than Martin Luther ever was in the 16th century, right? In, those folks were genuinely terrified of the thought of eternal torment. Um, now, there are still some evangelicals who are in, in that state too, um, but probably most Episcopalians in America are not there, right? Um, which is probably a good thing, right? A, a little bit of the fear of God goes a long way, right? Um, and it's, it's good that I think most of us are not worried that if we take a step in the wrong direction, we'll be tortured for eternity. So that's, that's one thing. Um, universalism, well, there's several ways to get there. I wonder if you've been reading David Hart, who's been pushing this point quite a bit. Um, I, what I would say is that for people who are anxious about what it's gonna be like facing the judgment of God, right? It's really very, very comforting and very helpful to hang on to that baptismal sacramental life, right? To remember that this is what God is saying to you in Jesus Christ. But then the next step is to recognize our Lord Jesus Christ did die for the sins of the whole world, right? So we have reason to hope that he will redeem the whole world, right? There's, there's lots of, you know, as you get further away from the center of the Christian faith, there's lots of things that are hard to, to discern, right? It's like looking far away into the shadows. But I think we can be confident that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ aims to redeem the whole world. And in one way or another, he will get what he wants. And what he wants, I think, is the whole creation. Um, how that works out, I think, is going to be complicated and I do think that there is a place for the fear of God. There's a place for something like divine punishment. Um, Jesus warns us about that kind of thing. But I, I do think what, what, when our Lord Jesus warns us about punishment after death, what he's warning us about is the coming of the new age. Um, so here's one little bit of biblical exegesis. The phrase eternal life, and also the phrase eternal punishment, which shows up once or twice in the New Testament, comes from a Greek word that refers to ages. And it could actually be translated something like the age-long punishment or the age-long life, because we live in this present evil age, and this age is coming to an end, and a new age will begin. That's one of the things that, that, the, that we're confessing when we say he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. There's a new age coming, but there's, there's a reckoning, I think. I, I do think we want to keep the notion of divine judgment and of a divine reckoning, right? Because a blanket mercy that doesn't recognize the difference between victim and oppressor, between Hitler and a tortured child, there, there's something wrong with that, right? There, there does have to be a reckoning, but I don't think it's going to be eternal torture, right? I do think there's going to be something like divine punishment. There's something we really should be afraid of in terms of God looking at my life and saying, Phil, I gave you so many talents and abilities and so many opportunities and look what a mess you made of this, right? Um, or, you know, the, 
Oh, it, yeah. it, it does sound it yeah. does sound like you yeah. I, I hope I don't put words in your mouth but I, it does sound like you're saying that um, there is an etern there is reckoning yeah but the issue is not salvation in the sort of thinking about that but th there's a, a way in which God works in us and judges us and yeah. and, and all people yeah. Um, anyway, that, you, right. you don't have to keep on this if you don't want to, but right. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate what you've said so far. I really do. Well, maybe one last thing. Um, I think that good is of a nature to be eternal and evil is not. Um, maybe one last thought about, about hell. Uh, if you think about Dante, if you've ever read Dante's Divine Comedy and you, you walk through hell with Dante, um, these people are supposed to be there for eternity, right? Well, how is that possible? Right. I mean, it's only just if these people stay sinners for eternity. Right. If any of them were to repent, well, that would mess everything up. Right. It would mess up hell. Right. They have to be confirmed in evil. It's a, a medieval doctrine about how these people, by the by the judgment of God, will never repent, will never cease being sinners who hate God. Right. Now, why would God do that? Right. Keeping them sinners so that they may be eternally punished. Right. That's God preserving evil forever so that sin may, be, may endure forever. Right. That doesn't make sense to me. God doesn't want sin to, to endure forever. Right. He may punish sin. I think he does. But there's an end to that, which is that sinners stop being sinners eventually. Right. Because goodness and blessing are, are, are they are of a nature to be eternal and evil and sin and death are not. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Professor Kerry? Um, yeah. I went the other way. I was a Roman Catholic, and in the 70s, I ended up at the Episcopal Church. Although I guess I never really read all the documents, maybe. So <laughs> Catholics have a very specific seven sacraments. Right. Um, and what about Lutherans and Episcopalians? Do they have uh, okay. same, numbers, same things or different things? Right, good. Well, sacraments, yeah, sacraments are an issue. Um, there's a real spectrum. Um, if you're a Baptist way over on, on the Protestant low church spectrum, right, they don't even talk about sacraments. Baptism for them is an ordinance or a token. Um, Catholics have seven sacraments. Um, what happened is over the course of the Middle Ages, um, the sacramental thinking got concentrated in seven particular church uh, church rites, church rituals that became uh, sacraments in a, in a narrow technical sense. Turns out the word sacrament in Latin, sacramentum, is the translation for the word mystery in Greek, mysterion. So the Greek word mysterion, which means mystery in the New Testament, gets translated into Latin as sacramentum. So there's a broad sense of sacrament. The mystery of God's presence in the world, the mystery of Christ's coming, uh, the, the mystery that was hidden for ages and is revealed in Christ. That's all a sacrament, right? This is that broad sense of sacrament or part of the broad sense of sacrament that I think John was interested in. Um, Christ is the sacrament, the, 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 the hidden mystery of God that is now revealed. But then you had this narrowing, this you know, because the word words can have a broad sense and a narrow sense. In the broad sense, sacrament is any mystery that reveals God, like, like the incarnation. In the narrow sense, it's these seven church rites, um, baptism, Eucharist, uh, penance, uh, ordination, uh, extreme unction uh, or anointing of the dead, marriage, and confirmation. Um, that's the, the seven sacraments. It, they're called the seven mysteries in Eastern Orthodoxy because mysteries is, is the Greek word for sacrament. Um, Luther came along and he was worried that the sacraments were kind of owned by the, by the Pope, owned by the, right? So in other words, instead of the sacraments being a way for God to give us grace, in Luther's day, sacraments were used to control people. Um, you could go to the sacrament of penance and the priest would say, I'm not gonna absolve you of your sins until you pay this or that. Or if you go and buy an indulgence, you can get um, your sins forgiven for the next 10 years or something, right? So the, it became a money-making um, venture, right? Sacraments became a way of making money. Uh, it became a way of ship, uh, shipping a lot of money from Germany down to Italy. Um, it, became, um, it became a racket. 
And Luther didn't like this. Right? Um, so he said, look, there's really only two sacraments that are clearly um, ordained by our Lord Jesus in the Bible. There's the Eucharist and then there's baptism. There's also penance because there's that uh, promise of the keys. But then Luther said, you know, penance really is just a form of baptism. Luther ended up saying penance really is a sacrament, but it's really just an extension of the sacrament of baptism. It's not a different sacrament. So depending on when you ask him, Luther will say there's two sacraments or three. Uh, sometimes he says three, sometimes he says two. Most Protestants will just say two. Uh, but Luther really loves the sacrament of penance because he, he thinks that if you're anxious about your sins, right, you're anxious that you're a sinner and you go to hell, you really want to hear this word of absolution, don't you? Right? And many Lutherans, um, they, they love the L word of absolution, especially in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, which begins all of its services with an absolution. Right? It's like, yes, tell me that I'm forgiven. I want to hear that. Right. Um, but um, the other sacraments are things like, well, marriage. Luther thinks marriage is a wonderful thing. God ordains it, but it's, it's not a sacrament. It, it's, it's a different kind of thing. So Luther will pretty much honor these other church uh, ceremonies, but he won't call them, we won't give them that narrow technical meaning of sacrament. Um, so confirmation, for instance, um, that's not a sacrament, but Lutherans practice it. Lutherans make a big deal of confirmation, but they just don't think of it as a sacrament. Uh, so it's a church practice that does all sorts of good, but is not strictly speaking a sacrament. Our prayer book, actually, our prayer book does both things, actually. It, hmm. Our penitential rites uh -huh. uh, are a Calvinist arrangement of, lit of worship where you confess and are absolved at the beginning of the service. Uh -huh. So you can, um, you're in a state of grace so you can hear the word right. and the sacrament. Um, the normal Eucharist has the penance in the Catholic position um, after the creed and the prayers, but before communion. Ah, uh huh. Right. So you're in a state of grace to have communion, right? right? And the Word convicts you, and you confess, and then you receive, right? So it's it's our our brilliant prayer book can be both Calvinistic and Catholic at the same moment, which the I Episcop love. yeah. The Episcopalians always want it both ways. Yeah, right? we, we do. We, that's another thing that makes us nutty, but I love it. Um, you start with the Collect for Purity. <laughs> um, which is good. And then uh, there's usually, let's see, well, the, the rite that, that we have in my Anglo-Catholic parish, just before communion, there's the, the, the word, um, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but you speak the word only and my soul shall be healed. You say that right before you go up for communion, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's also a confession of sin earlier, right? Yeah. right. Why not, right? Um, yeah. And a wonderful thing about um, Professor Carey's book is he roots theology firmly in the work of the church and the, and the worship of the church is, yeah. and, and the sign of good theology is whether it makes a healthy, faithful church, <laughs> a loving church. So I, I love, I just, very clear um, stuff. Um, one thing I was hoping you'd comment on is um, I really loved what you did with Augustine in the book. Um, oh. And I, I want to read more of your work on Augustine, but you, you, it seemed to me you traced that medieval anxiety about am I in grace or not. Right. All the back, way back to Augustine. Yeah. Back to Augustine and this notion of we make progress towards God. Ah, uh, yeah. Kind of Platonic progress towards God, which still definitely infects the Episcopal Church, this notion that I'm, you know, I'm going to work my spiritual life towards God, right? Um, which in... in and it sets up this tension between the kind of the, um, how do I want to put this? Um, I, I'm a, I'm, I come from like a Bardian background. So I would like, oh, to, okay. I'd like to say the dogmatic proclamation of Christ versus the kind of uh, platonic um, humanism of yeah. a person working their way to God, seeking God, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, I worked my way back to Augustine from Bart. I started with Karl Bart, the great 20th century theologian, I got dissatisfied with certain aspects of Barth that I thought Luther did better. Then I thought, okay, let me get the Augustinian background to Luther. So we'll start reading Luther. I mean, I started reading Augustine and you know, that became three books because Augustine was different from what people told me he was. And he's more fascinating than I thought. I can say a little bit about that as a matter of fact, because um, the, the sort of big verbal difference between Catholics and Protestants is that Protestants believe in justification by faith alone and Catholics believe in justification by faith. 
period, right? Not justification by faith alone. And what Catholics will say is it's justification by faith working through love, which is a quotation from Galatians. And it's, you know, Catholics and Protestants agree, faith works through love. Faith is active in doing works of love. If you have Christian faith, you'll end up learning to love, right? Of course you do. But does that love help justify you? Luther says no, Catholics say yes, right? Why? Well, it really goes back to Augustine, I think. Augustine thinks of faith as how you get started on the road to God, right? Faith is where you begin, but it can't be where you end. Faith, you, you, uh, we, we walk by faith, but we want to reach sight, right? Um, we now walk by faith, but we want our faith to become vision, right? Uh, uh, we want our faith to turn into sight and vision. That is, we want to see God. Right? We want this, uh, what Catholics call the beatific vision, where you see the very essence of God. That's what we want. How do we get from faith to vision? The, the pathway from faith to vision is love. Love is like this force of attraction. Uh, Augustine actually compares it to gravity, except in, in ancient physics, gravity could, could pull you upward. If, if you're made out of fire, fire goes upward, right? In ancient physics, right? It goes up to heaven where, where the stars are made of fire, right? So that's ancient physics. You know, stone goes downward, fire goes upward. So love of God is like fire. Right? Fire that doesn't consume you, but pulls you upward. So the journey to God is the journey from faith through love to vision. So it so love becomes how you get to God. Love becomes how you are drawn to God, how you're united to God, because love unites you with what you love. And here's the problem. Here you are on this road to God through love. And then suppose that your life gets derailed and you'd rather commit adultery. And you know it's against the law of God, but you, you, want, you want adultery more than you want God, right? All of a sudden this love, which ought to be pulling you to God, is pulling you in a very different direction. It's called mortal sin, right? There's that mortal sin notion. This is why there are so many Christians in hell in Dante, right? Um, you can have the right faith, but you wanted, you preferred to commit adultery rather than loving God, right? So instead of this journey to God, you took a, a detour and went the other direction and now you're in hell. And the fascinating difference between Catholics and Protestants on this, in, in the Protestant vision of hell, there's no Christians in hell because you're justified by faith alone. Christian faith is enough right? In the Catholic view, if you have the right faith, but don't have the love that pulls you to God, you're, you're, you can be like all those Christian sinners in Dante's hell. And then the question is, suppose that you're the kind of person who's anxious about your salvation, and you wonder, do I really love God enough, right? And that's the situation in the 16th century. Basically, a millennium after Augustine, all these people are worried that I'm still on the road and my love is not perfect enough and my love is incomplete and I don't love God as much as I should. And am I in a state of mortal sin? How can I tell? Like you, you actually are, are not supposed to be able to know whether you're in a state of mortal sin, which is terrifying. So the journey becomes a source of anxiety because it's a journey that happens in our hearts and our hearts are not always where they should be, right? And so the, the justification by faith alone stuff in Protestantism is meant to circumvent that and say, just put your trust in the word of God, put your trust in the gospel, put your trust in your baptism, which is God's word to you. But don't think that your heart is gonna tell you how you're getting to God. Um, uh, and then the good news is um, the journey is not really our journey to God. It's God's journey to us. That's what the incarnation is. That's what Christ has done. Uh, the incarnation is not our way to get to God. It's, it's God's way to us. And he does that. He gets all the way down to, to Mary's womb and then to the, the, the manger and then to the cross. And then he's given to us in the gospel. That's God's way to us. And that's good enough. And that's a great relief. So one picking up on one more thing that you said, Jared, um, I think one of the measures of good theology is it's cheerful. Good theology ought to cheer you up um, because it ought to get you in touch somehow with the beauty and goodness of God. Um, but then you, you, you always got to deal with those anxieties one way or another, because they're always there. Yeah. Um, Barb? Where does the, um, who owns the idea that faith is a gift? And if faith is a gift, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I've met many people who have said, I don't got it. And I, I don't got it. And if God gives it and some don't have it, it seems like it's kind of a, kind of trap. So. Yeah. Um, 
Oh boy, oh boy. Right. So <laughs> Luther is one of the people who thinks very emphatically faith is a gift. Um, but he's <clears throat> right. So so Augustine also thinks faith is a gift. It's a gift of, of grace. Um, now, some people think it's really just up to your decision, but then you can have that problem of, of keeping on making the same decisions for 5,000 times. Um, what Luther thinks, actually, this cheers me up, so let me tell you about it. Luther um, writes a, a short catechism for children uh, called the Shorter Catechism, and when he gets to the article of the Creed on the Holy Spirit, he says, here's what you should believe. I believe that I cannot believe by my own strength and power. But the, but the Holy Spirit has given me the true faith and preserves me in it from now into eternal life. In other words, you're supposed to believe that you believe. Why? Because you believe in the Holy Spirit. Not because you can look at your heart and say, oh, I believe. Right? No, you look at your heart and your heart sometimes doesn't believe. Often it seems incapable of belief. Luther thinks that's all of us, really. Right? In the depths of our heart, we're unbelievers most of the time. Right? That's why we should believe that we have the true faith because the Holy Spirit has given it to us, right? Um, and he teaches that to children, right? Lutheran children learn to say, I cannot believe by my own strength, but the Holy Spirit has given me the true faith. And, and that way, you don't have to look at your heart and see whether you're a believer. You can look at your heart and say, eh, 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 I don't really have much faith, but God has given me faith. He said so, so I better believe that, right? And that, that really helps, right? Um, one last thing actually about that too. Um, Luther knew a whole lot about what it's like to be wrestling with doubts. Um, and, and he's got a whole spirituality about that. One of the most lovely things he says about this is when you are really wrestling with doubt, when you can't, you can, you can only wish that you believe because you really can't feel your faith. You can't feel Christ's presence. You don't experience his presence. You, you just wish you could believe but that's as, as close to belief as you can get. When that happens, that mere anxious wish to believe, that's the sigh of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about in Romans 8. It is a mighty cry to heaven for the mercy of God, which you can't hear because you don't experience it. But God hears it because it's the Holy Spirit crying out in your heart. So when you're anxious about your unbelief and, and wish you could believe, then you're the strongest believer of all, Luther says. Right? And, and he's applying it to his own life because he feels that way a lot himself. Oh, wow. That's great stuff. Yeah. Your, uh, your comprehensive knowledge of Luther is so interesting. Is one last question, maybe, and then we'll wrap up. Anybody else have anything else to ask or uh, explore? If not, we'll, uh, I'll make a few announcements. And let's first thank um, Professor Carey. Thank you very much. This has been really fascinating. Here. I really recommend this book. Uh, it's, he's a great thinker and a great writer. It, it's really readable. Um, I, I, it doesn't, you don't have to be a specialist in theology to read this book or philosophy, I would say. Um, it's very accessible and very clearly written and uh, I really recommend it. So uh, I've really enjoyed it. It was recommended to me by a priest friend and that's high recommendation, right? Because- uh, A Catholic priest? What? A, a, a Episcopal priest. Ah, okay. Sorry, yeah. Right. But, um, the uh, it, when another priest offers me a theology book, I kind of take it seriously because we have a limited amount of time to read stuff. <laughs> it's got to matter. It's got to make a difference for what we do. So, um, so once again, it's a great book. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I love it. It's really good stuff. Um, so in Lent, we're going to have uh, Bonnie Hoffman Adams. Wave again, Bonnie. Okay. It's going to be doing a three-part class on salvation at this time which I'm really excited about. I'll be putting you on the spot there, Bonnie, but we're excited about it. Well, listen, it sounds terrible in a way. Only three, three sessions all about salvation. It isn't all about salvation. It's just a little part of it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not as ambitious as that quite sounds. Sorry. Yeah, Bonnie's going to explain salvation completely in three Wednesday <laughs> evenings. Um, so um, Hope you'll join us for that. And um, after that, I'll have a Wednesday evening on Marilyn Robinson's book, Jack, mm. uh, which I think explores a lot of the same territory. Uh, so if you want to, if you've read Jack, join me. If you haven't read Jack, start reading Jack mm. and join for uh, that Wednesday for reading with the rector. It's, it's a gorgeous, wonderful book. It's a theological reflection in the form of a novel. And then the week after that, um, Barb Ballinger has Theology of the Cross, 
but not in the sense that Luther meant it, because <laughs> um, that was Luther's self-hating phase. Um, yeah, so. um, right. Um, this is more in the Moltmann sense of theology of the cross, um, uh, much healthier. <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm the week before you. We just swapped. Oh, flipped. You're right. We flipped because I wanted to give people more time to reject. Um, so uh, anyway, it's going to be a great Lent of theological reflection. Thank you all for joining. It's great to see everybody's face. I hope we can do this again sometime, uh, Professor Carey. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, and, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Having a good evening, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye, friends. God thank bless. You.